Welcome back to Black News Tonight. As we celebrate the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., it is important for us to remember the man, not how we want him to be, but how he actually was. Here to help me understand and unpack the true life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. is the founding director for the Center of the Study of Race and Democracy at the University of Texas, Austin, and the author of The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Peniel Joseph Peniel, good to see you as always. When we talk about Martin Luther King Jr., what is perhaps the most, the most misunderstood dimension of his life? I think the most misunderstood dimension of King is that uh, King is somehow not a revolutionary. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is really one of the key revolutionaries of the 20th century, alongside people like Malcolm X, of course, uh, people like Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, Angela Davis. And when I say revolutionary, I mean that King wanted to fundam fundamentally transform the way in which uh, black people were, were viewed uh, by the government and by humanity uh, in American society and globally. Um, so I think the biggest misunderstanding of King is that somehow because he preached nonviolence, he was not in fact a political revolutionary. And, and I think part of that is understanding nonviolence as a radical or even revolutionary tactic. Kingian nonviolence wasn't, we are gonna sit here, get beaten in the head and pray that things work out. There was something strategic and tactical about his choices, his performances of nonviolent resistance, whether it's the Pettus Bridge or whether it's sit-ins. Talk to me a little bit about what it means to be nonviolent in King's tradition. Yeah, King is a practitioner of nonviolent civil disobedience, and that's a tradition that goes back to really biblical times. Certainly Gandhi used it in terms of taking the yoke of British colonialism off of India and, and Pakistan. Um, for King, nonviolence was a strategic way to figuratively disarm his opponents. King understood that white supremacy trafficked in violence, violence against black bodies, black people, but violence against humanity. So King um, undertook this mission of utilizing nonviolent civil disobedience to make people who were opponents of black citizenship and black dignity bend to the will of really black aspirations, right? So when we think about, it's not just the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but it's also St. Augustine, Florida. It's also the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, it's also uh, King is, is right there in Birmingham in the spring of 1963. These are all efforts to use nonviolent civil disobedience to one, show the world the depth and breadth of, of white racial terror against black Americans, right? But two, to also uh, perform um, dignity and to perform citizenship and to perform humanity, right? And then finally, three, to really disarm um, opponents. Because if you, if you resisted nonviolently, King said you would show both the evil of this system of white supremacy, but you also would show people the humanity of those who are being oppressed. So he, he's really this extraordinary architect uh, in that way. And when you think about King as a revolutionary, when he's talking about militarism, racism, materialism, King's critique of U.S. capitalism and imperialism. Uh, King is no longer on speaking terms with the president of the United States during the last three years of his life. So we see King, he exceedingly comes to see nonviolence as being connected to eradicating uh, what we sometimes call racial capitalism or racist capitalism, eradicating violence, eradicating racism, eradicating oppression wherever it can be found, both in the United States and globally. One of the narratives of King is that he, as he moved toward his death in 68, that he was abandoning some of his philosophies, that he had become increasingly radicalized. And this becomes part of that narrative that we attach to Malcolm X as well, that, that Malcolm was moving closer to the civil rights community. Uh, both of those narratives are problematic to me, but help my audience at least understand who King is by 68? Is King moving away? Is he regretting nonviolence? Is he becoming embittered toward white Americans? Who is King by the time he dies on April 4th of 68? You know, I don't think he's regretting nonviolence, but he's much closer to understanding uh, Malcolm X's view of black dignity. Malcolm X talked about radical black dignity as the end of what Malcolm called world white supremacy. 
King initially is this advocate of radical black citizenship. King thinks that citizenship is not just voting rights, but citizenship is human rights. It's a guaranteed living wage. It's housing. It's desegregation and racial integration of public schools and neighborhoods. It's the end of war and violence. Over time, he comes to see why Malcolm was so interested in black dignity. Malcolm thought of dignity as something that was a given, something that black people didn't need bestowed by governments, or they, they didn't need um, military escorts to schools. King becomes increasingly passionately angry about the level of anti-black racism in the United States by 1968. He's also passionately angry about the way in which white political leaders are willing to redistribute wealth towards war, but not towards justice. And so when we think about King, uh, one of his biographers calls him a pillar of fire, and that's an Old Testament statement. He really does become this pillar of fire. He becomes somebody who is so passionately uh, interested in publicly loving black people and saying that um, uh, justice is what love looks like in public, that he becomes somebody who is unfamiliar to people who only think of King as that figure at the March on Washington. Because at the March on Washington, King is talking about reparations, he's talking about transformation, but he's doing it in cadences that are still acceptable because he's got the I have the dream peroration at the end. By 1968, King is angry. So it's not to say that King starts to leave nonviolence behind, but I think he has a much more holistic understanding of the black community and black history. I think, I think Malcolm X, I think the black power movement, Stokely Carmichael, all these things, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, welfare rights uh, activists and mothers and organizers give King a much more holistic picture of the United States of America and globally. Absolutely. Uh, Penny, I want you to stay right here. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we want to continue to unpack the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and figure out why, at the time of his death, he had become an enemy of the state. Stay right here. Welcome back to Black News tonight. We're talking about the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. I'm joined now still by Dr. Peniel Joseph, who is an expert on black political figures, but particularly the life of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Peniel, when we were talking before the break, we were thinking through the kind of trajectory of Martin King, how he goes from someone deeply committed to expanding American democracy, democracy to someone who by the end is still has that commitment, but is angry, is frustrated. Uh, and is forced to wrestle with some of these contradictions of American democracy. Uh, it's easy now to think of King as America's hero, the kind of patriarch of civil rights, but when King dies, he's wildly unpopular because of those positions and because of his frustrations. Help me understand why. Well, when King dies, he's wildly unpopular in large segments of the white community. And it's because King starts to vociferously denounce racism. Uh, I'll take us back to April 4th, 1967 at the Riverside Church in New York. King speaks out against the Vietnam War. He says there comes a time when silence is betrayal. He says in that speech in New York City that the United States of America is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, April 4th, 1968, one year before his assassination. Eight days later, on April 15th, 1967, King is with Harry Belafonte, Stokely Carmichael, and other activists, and there's gonna be a million people who march against the war. They start at the United Nations, um, and there's a huge, there's a huge rally. And King is going to say, stop the bombing, stop the bombing. Uh, the last Sunday in April, King invites Stokely Carmichael to Ebenezer Baptist Church to hear him further denounce the war in Vietnam, and in so doing, really denounce uh, the Great Society, the Johnson administration, for not doing, not only not doing enough to end racism and structural racism, but also distributing the funds that should have gone to the war on poverty uh, to the Vietnam War. So when we think about King, he becomes an enemy of the state even earlier than this. J. Edgar Hoover spots him as this radical subversive in the 1960s. Bobby Kennedy allows a wiretap, an illegal wiretap starting in 1963 that continues through the Lyndon Baines Johnson administration. So he becomes an enemy 
of the state because he's interested in radical democracy and human rights and, and food for the poor and the eradication of racism and segregation and white supremacy. So King becomes an enemy because he's this human rights champion and this person who really is in love with black people until the day he dies. One of the things we tend to do is lump people in piles, and we have the Malcolms over here, we got the, the Panthers over there, we got Martin over here. And as you're talking about feeding, clothing, and sheltering people, as you're talking about uh, economic justice, it sounds to me very much like the Panthers program, their 10-point program, which is very much connected to even the Nation of Islam's uh, 10, the what we want, right? And so, and what we believe. And so, to what extent is King in line with and in conversation with the Black Panther Party? You mentioned Stokely, and I know Stokely loved to hear Martin talk. He said, even if I don't believe some of that stuff, you make me tap my feet. How, how, how does the rest of the Panthers connect with King? Well, I think King and the Panthers are both anti-imperialist. They're, they're critics of capitalism. Um, they're, they're radical and revolutionary activists. They diverge on the issue of violence, right? The Panthers believe in self-defense. And King did not disbelieve in self-defense, but the Panthers also believed in revolutionary violence. They were, they were, they were interested in the, the Cuban Revolution and African decolonization and revolutionary movements. But in terms of, in a broader way, these are both advocates of radical black citizenship and radical black dignity. So there's a lot of, lot of convergence there. And one example of this is gonna be in 1968 with the Poor People's Campaign. King is in Marks, Mississippi, Quitman County, the poorest county in Mississippi, and he, he, he tells the people there that the way in which they're being treated, poor black people, is a crime. He starts to speak in the same language of Malcolm X, who used to accuse white authorities of crimes against black humanity. But what King does in that talk in Marks, Mississippi, and we have this on, on, on film, Mark, he tells the black people in Marx about the reconstruction period and how black people were promised 40 acres and a mule, did not receive the 40 acres and a mule, and white people got millions of acres of free land from the Homestead Act. And King says that not only was this racist and wrong, he says, these are the same white people who are telling you now to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. And King says, this is who we're going to challenge and face in Washington, D.C. And King says, he's not bringing guns or knives to Washington, Mark, but he's gonna sit in and camp in in Washington, D.C. forever. So remember, King is the person who organizes the first Occupy Washington movement. Way before Occupy Wall Street, King was organizing to occupy the nation's capital until Congress and the president did the right thing. So it is no wonder that King is assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, Thursday, April 4th, 1968, 6 p.m. Memphis time, while he's preparing to go to Washington, D.C., and he's helping out 1,100 striking sanitation workers who are striking for what we now call a living wage. Peniel, before you go, help me understand one more thing. If King is this radical, if he's this disruptive to the status quo, if he's this much of a threat to the state, if he's this much of an enemy, how is it that now, 50 plus years after his death, the right is using him, Republicans are quoting him, people who are pro-capitalist and pro or anti-reproductive justice and people who are imperialist, how are they all quoting King with the same fervor? Well, this is a product of the narrative war that we won, the black community won in 1983 to get King's holiday uh, into law, a federal holiday. That was a huge victory because white supremacists wanted to forget everything about King in that era. But within that victory, we took a loss. We took a loss by saying we would agree to only remember King in a way that was palatable or acceptable to the establishment. And that's how you have conservatives, people who are really 21st century versions of the 19th century redemptionists, the Redeemer South, the Klansmen and the Klans women who killed and murdered and maimed and raped black people in the aftermath of racial slavery during Reconstruction, quoting King. So we have to remember that even when we win these holidays and this recognition, we have to always fight, Mark, for the narrative war. How are we gonna remember 
Kwame Toure, Stokely Carmichael? How are we going to remember Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker? Are we going to remember them on our terms, how they radically loved us? Or are we going to remember them on the terms of the establishment, which is always going to make them milk toast figures and figures that can be warped and accommodated rather than these liberation revolutionary figures that were disruptors, that were passionate advocates of black humanity, black dignity, and black citizenship?